Right, yeah, thank you. So, so we have a, a total fleet of about 5,500 vehicles. That's everything from the kind of heavy, heavy tractors on the right-hand side um, down to uh, vans and um, small trucks, the heavy trucks used for delivering goods, partly from suppliers into our distribution centres, but mainly from our distribution centres um, into our shops, and then the smaller vans using to deliver direct to, to our customers. Um, this chap on the right, by the way, is Gary, who runs our, our workshops. Um, and you might notice the truck in the middle is parked on a pedestrian crossing. I actually have a version of this slide with that airbrushed out, but I, I used the wrong one, so apologies for that blatant health and safety um, faux pas. Um, so yeah, our, 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 our two main commitments, as Tim mentioned, is, is that we, we will be fossil fuel by, by 2030 and zero emission by 2035. And we're going to do that by by electrifying everything that we can electrify. Um, long distance heavy trucks right now, that's not really doable, certainly not in a, in a cost effective way. So those will all be running on on, uh, on biomethane. Um, and for the, the last little niches, and we do have a combine harvester on our farm, we'll see a picture of it a little bit later on. Um, so vehicles like that, that we can't run on either electricity or um, uh, on, on biomethane will be running on, on HVO biodiesel. Um, and what does that do for us? Well, it saves about half a million tonnes of CO2 between 2020 and 2030, um, which is the main point. Um, that's about an 80% reduction over using sort of um, BAU diesel. It also gives us a revenue saving, and that's, that's crucial because, you know, like many businesses, we operate at the very low margins. So whatever we do in this has, has to have its own business case. Um, and there are also other benefits from this transition. One of them is that we can expect lower maintenance costs from EVs. Um, and for some sectors, we think we can make vehicles last a lot longer, um, electric vans being a good example. So, so this then is, is our standard um, kind of Waitrose delivery truck. Uh, the truck's running on, on, on biomethane gas. It is lighter than the standard sort of heavy duty truck pulling a trailer. So those ones you see running around, mainly 44 tons, it'll be a three axle truck, three axle trailer. We don't need all, all of that payload. And, and unlike a lot of businesses that operate at 44 tons, just in case, we optimize ours for, ours for the kind of 32 tons that we operate at typically, which means smaller vehicle, fewer axles, which means um, smaller engine, lighter weight, which in turn saves fuel. Um, the trailer has been designed in conjunction with Cambridge University. It's built very low. It's got a boat tail back end and various other features that make it very aer um, aerodynamic. And that, that saves about 7% of fuel at a steady um, speed of, of 56 miles an hour. The fridge is also very important. So Waitrose, as a, as a grocer, we carry temperature control goods. And the solution we're using on, on these, and obviously delighted to hear about um, SunSwap, uh, is that we, we generate additional electricity on the tractor, and we use that to power the fridge um, on the front of the trailer. We're also, in, in many cases now, when the trailer arrives at a depot, we plug it into the mains there, again, rather than using that, that diesel engine. And at one site, since we started doing that, um, in, in Bracknell, over 14 months, we've saved 1,000 tonnes of CO2 and half a million pounds worth of um, net fuel savings. So, so, so some, some really good sensible stuff here that, that uh, the fleets can do. Um, so what about the home delivery side of it? Well, efficiency, again, is absolutely key to making it work. Um, we need to minimise the energy requirement, and that's, that's partly through on the vehicles themselves, managing the heat, managing driving style, building the vehicle as lightweight um, as we can, obviously have, having the best possible route scheduling um, and so on. By doing that, we can then have a smaller battery. That means the vehicle's got a, um, a better payload. It costs less in the first place. Um, and it also means that the task of charging it becomes a little bit easier. That in turn means that we can have a strategy of charging vehicles on a slow charge overnight, which means the infrastructure is lower cost. It's a lot better for the battery um, as well. A little bit of rapid charging in those cases where a vehicle can't get through typically two routes in a day without a charge in, in the middle. Um, and some smart scheduling. And, and what that means is that if we understand the state of charge of all the fleet um, as it's out on the road, we can predict what state of charge it'll be when it gets back based on its routes, which means we allocate vehicles to the second route based on their state of charge and what that route requires. It also means that if we know how much energy they're going to need for the following day's routes, then we only charge them up to the level they actually need. And that, again, is, is good for the charging infrastructure. It's also very good for the batteries themselves. That also then means that we can minimise the use for, for expensive and, and um, 
long lead time grid upgrades um, onto our sites. We need to do that in a, but by, by also taking a holistic view of the energy requirements of the whole site. So load management, behold, we, we heard earlier um, from Shane about, you know, do we turn off the coal store for a bit in order to divert more energy into, into vehicle charging if it's needed? So what about the energy? Um, it's got to be properly sustainable. Not, not all biofuels are sustainable. Um, it's not sustainable to, uh, even if you're buying green electricity, to, to then charge vehicles up at peak times. You know, that's like a, a slightly delusional thing um, because you could be causing a gas power, power station to be charged up in order to meet the extra demand. So, so when we charge is, is really important. Um, securing long-term long -term supplies. So we, we, we've made commitments about using biomethane, so it's, it's therefore important that we we seek long-term suppliers, um, and we also have price confidence uh, over those because, as we all know, e energy pricing has been very volatile in the last couple of years. Um, so what about fugitive methane capture? We, we heard from, 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 uh, from, from uh, uh, Benjamin earlier, so, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, and I'll, I won't go on too much about this but because we've already heard about it, but the great benefit of this, and we are doing this in our in our farm uh, in Leckford, in conjunction with with with, with the Benjamin, is yes, it costs it it, it saves um, costs energy costs clearly. It also saves greenhouse gases, not not just the fugitive methane, um, but also fugitive uh, ammonia um, is is also captured within the the um, uh, the envelope. Um, we can then become self-sufficient on fertilizer will be a great thing to do. We're not quite there yet, but we, we heard about use of the digestate as a, as a fertilizer on the farm. So, so some, some, some really important things from, from, from capturing that slurry, which uh, is largely formed of carbon and nitrogen. So why don't we separate off the carbon, use that for fuel, separate off the nitrogen, use that for fertilizer. Um, this is the... The schematic again. I won't. I won't dwell on this, but because we've um, we've heard about it, and I'll get shot if I go over, over 10, 10 minutes anyway. So um, we'll scoot over that one, and we'll just look at the the the, the refueling. So this isn't this isn't actually plumbed in yet. I must be honest, um, but this is how it how it will look. So that, that's one of our our gas truck our gas trucks on the right there. We'll be using those to to take any surplus biomethane, and that's our our uh, biomethane powered tractor just sneaking out on the left hand side there. Um, so what's our aim then? Our, our aim is to, is to make our farm um, zero carbon, um, to be self-sufficient in fertilizer, and there's all sorts of fancy stuff we can, we can do around you know, underplanting things like, like clover to, to, to capture nitrates. I'm an engineer, not a farmer, so please don't ask me any, any questions in any more depth about this stuff, but it is quite fascinating. Um, keeping the soil structure, so avoiding plowing wherever we, um, we can for a real healthy, um, uh, fertile soil structure with lo lots of diversity within it, and natural pest control, you know, planting um, uh, wildflowers around the, the, the edge of crops. Um, crop rotation is very important as well on, on how we do that. Um, so in, in summary then, with all of this stuff, we need to take a really holistic view over all of the energy needs, where they're going, how can we control them, how can we minimize energy is, 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 the, is the first question we ought to be asking. Um, we also need to, to prioritize productivity in vehicles. So, so the, the, there are opportunities with EVs um, to build them with a lower floor. Um, that means that they can, they can, we can work out of them better. There's also opportunities to get more payload than we can on a standard sort of three and a half ton style um, diesel electric van. We can actually operate a higher, higher payloads within EVs because we can operate them at the higher weights. Those kind of things that improve productivity um, can be the difference between having a business case that works and one that that doesn't work. Um, properly sustainable energy, we've already talked about, really important to understand where does it come from, when do we use it, what's the whole energy supply chain, you know, are, are the secondary effects um, in developing countries that result in deforestation, for example, with, with, with some biofuel. So, so really understanding it, having a properly robust control over, over that supply chain, or certainly um, transparency of it. Um, and finally, resilience, we, we, we've heard as well, you know, we, we, we can, we, we take resilience for granted, supply chains at the moment are very, very resilient. But once we move away from diesel and that ability to, to get fuel, you know, almost anywhere in the country, um, you've got to think about if you're, if you're running uh, like an EV fleet that's relying on chargers, the chargers break, you've got a real problem. Um, likewise, if, you, if you're relying on a, a single biomethane 
and plant to power your trucks and that that breaks down you've got a real problem so so planning for that having redundancy built into it etc um really key on that point um i'll stop thank you very much